I'm Joe Ring with the Friends of Tower Hill Park here in Prospect Park and I'm standing before a public art piece that's in the Prospect Park light rail station and uh, we get a number of questions about the significance of this uh, piece of artwork. Uh, each of the uh, light rail stations for each of the communities has a piece of public artwork and it, it's supposed to identify the neighborhood in which the station is in but a lot of people are puzzled as, as to what this actually means and represents. So I'm going to point to you that you. you see a whole series of these shapes going all the way around these cylinders like this and on these little pieces here and no one understands what they represent or what the significance is. And uh, I'd like to be able to explain that to you. And the best way for me to do that is we're going to take a walk down to the end of the station here and I think I can uh, make it clear for you. So just follow me. Okay. Okay, we're on the end of the Prospect Park light rail station and you can see to my right, just over my shoulder, uh, a water tower, which is part of Prospect Park. And the roof line of that water tower has that shape that I showed you on the sculpture. The Witch's Hat water tower is the symbol of Prospect Park that everyone identifies with. It's, it represents who we are and what we are. And it's really significant to the Prospect Park community. So we're going to walk that way here so that uh, you can actually get a closer view. And you can actually uh, be, well, go up what is called Tower Hill Park. So follow me. Okay, we're stopping here at the entry point to Prospect Park residential area. And long before this was the entry to the residential community, it was the entry point to go, be able to go up the hill to the tower. And the reason we know that is that in 1848, when this was a territory, coach service began between St. Paul and St. Anthony Falls. And if you bought a ticket on that coach, you could buy a stop to be able to go to Tower Hill. And that was the first point in which people would d disembark here and to be able to go up the, up the hill to the tower. And uh, to, to be able to go up there, we need to go around the hill here and, uh, you know, by the sidewalk. But I prefer if we take the old original pathway. So if you follow me, we'll find the entrance to the pathway and we'll make our next stop. Okay, we're at the entrance to the original pathway. And uh, that pathway had gotten lost to, uh, to people using it uh, decades and decades ago. Uh, and we, we found that there was a pathway by looking at some photos shortly after the water tower was built in 1914. And you could actually see an outline uh, where the pathway was. And so that began our search. And when we located it, uh, we had our community got together and we uh, regraded it and put up the split rail fence uh, so people could use that original pathway. So we'll begin the trip up to the tower. So if you just keep following me, we'll go to our next stop, okay? Okay, we're going up the pathway. And one of the things that I really enjoy in using this pathway is that it's very nature uh, by nature, and you're in the middle of the metropolitan area of the Twin Cities, and you have this marvelous wooded area that's very quiet for an inner city area. And the big thing is, is you get to many times see really great wildlife. And the unique thing about the wildlife is I have been able to see, and my neighbors have been able to see, you know, uh, coons, uh, foxes, uh, coyotes, and oh, especially the families of turkeys that are oh, usually here. And they're, they're, they're just great. I love the turkeys. So uh, it's, it's really a pleasant trip. So I generally like to take this pathway as often as possible. So we'll just go through the bend here and then we'll be up near the tower. So come on.
Okay, we've come out of the pathway and we're at the base of the Witch's Hat Water Tower. Uh, obviously, from what I've said before, that this was not the original tower. This was uh, something that I'll go over in just a little bit, but uh, we know that there was a earlier tower uh, because of the written uh, notations uh, from the the coaches uh, trips that people would make and other notations historical documents in uh, 1900 when this area started to be developed as a residential area we're at the highest elevation in the city of minneapolis and their water service was terrible and so the neighbors got together and uh, decided to buy this property because this was privately owned and the idea was to donate it to the Parks Department with the hopes that the city would build a water tower here to increase the water pressure. And uh, that was the plan. And so that was done in 1906 and where they purchased the property and it was turned into a park. Unfortunately, it took a while. Uh, the city was not uh, in a hurry to build that water tower. But in 1913, all of a sudden, the city said, we got to build a water tower. And uh, the residents like to think they did it for them. But the reality is there were other motives, uh, you know. So, because what was happening is in Southeast Minneapolis here, there was a tremendous increase in industrial development. And uh, in, the, in the year 1913, a proposal came forward to build a tractor factory here in southeast Minneapolis um, and uh, the reason they chose this site is that the the railroad uh, lines here were really significant and they went to all corners of the country and they would be able to ship their tractors to anywhere in the world actually. So the city began the process of developing a water tower to be able to provide that water pressure for those industrial users. Now, this company was called Bull Tractor. In 1913, they began construction in August. The tower was put into service in April of 1914. They had a dedication in July of 1914. So in that sp short span of time, they built that tower. Tremendous feat, considering everything that was brought up there was brought up by mule. And the reason we know that is we have images of the actual construction. And that gives you an idea of how difficult this was. And they were actually building that. This is now in November around us here. And that's when they were building that tower in this cool environment. And they went through the winter. Now the Bull Tractor Company had uh, patents on their tractors which were very significant and very unusual and they could make a very affordable tractor. And they began production in 19, late 1913 going into 1914 and began shipping their tractors in 1914. They began shipping tractors all over the world. They were producing well over 10,000 tractors a year. They were the largest manufacturers of tractors in the world from 1914 until 1919. And at that point, they lost their market to people who were building larger tractors like Ford. And uh, they closed their factory and uh, they discontinued operations. Now you'll notice the time frame that I just gave you is significant because it aligns with World War I. And the beginning of World War I, the men at various points of the world were leaving their fields and they needed tractors for the women, their wives, the women that were left behind. Uh, they couldn't handle oxen and mules for plowing, so they needed a, a mechanized me method of being able to do that farm work. So they were shipping these tractors all over. So, uh, Bull Tractor discontinued operations in 1919. The industrial facilities that they left behind were eventually taken over by International Harvester. But there is a remnant of that enterprise. 
there were suppliers who started their businesses based upon supplying bull tractor. And one of the most noteworthy was a company that started at the same time that uh, bull tractor began to make their engines. And that company was called Toro. Now, we all know about Toro. So I'd like to now take you up to the observation uh, area uh, at the base of the tower so that we can see what this is all about. Let's go. Okay, here we are at the uh, view, we call the view pad at the base of the tower. And this is what it's all about. This is the view. This is the view of the city of Minneapolis from Tower Hill. And that's why there was a tower here originally before the water tower was built. And so people could avail themselves of this view. They could also see St. Paul and they could also see uh, as far uh, uh, off here as from uh, Fort Snelling. And uh, that view is what drove everything to be, to be able to come to this tower. And people would come here in large numbers to be able to see that view and especially go up to the tower. Uh, now, before all these buildings were built, we used to be able to see the falls from St. Anthony. And so when this was a territory, it was a big deal to be able to see the falls from up here, from what we understand. So, okay. So that gives you an idea. Okay, we're at the base and you've had an idea as to how far that view deck in the tower goes up there. Uh, when the city decided they wanted to build the water tower finally, they had to ask permission from the parks department to be able to build this structure because it was parks property. And in consultation with the residents in the neighborhood, the parks department said, you can build any kind of water tower you want. It's just that there's one qualifying thing you need to do, and that's provide that view deck. Because from that view deck, you could have a 365 degree view of the entire metropolitan area. And it's just a phenomenal thing. Unfortunately, we have very limited access to it publicly. Um, so it's, um, we can talk about that a little bit later, but uh, to fill you in with uh, more information, uh, once that was completed, uh, you know, the, it was used as a water tower until 1952. In 1952, it was decommissioned and the city planned on tearing the tower down. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, our little uh, Bluebird group got together and did a petition and uh, petitioned the city council to not tear the tower down. Uh, their efforts uh, availed themselves. Uh, later on, uh, the city uh, had the idea of possibly turning it over for use as a cell tower, uh, but uh, there would be virtually no public access, and uh, that was uh, nixed. And uh, since then, we've had uh, occasional public use, like for our ice cream social, and just recently for its 100th anniversary, we had it open. and. Uh, and also, we just started with the mayor's doors open event and have had it open for the public to be able to use. And the response was phenomenal. Uh, we had thousands and thousands of people show up. It just was overwhelming. We would have lines going back, up, going a block to be able to get in. So it has significance being able to use the view. And people are interested in that view. They're interested in the history of the tower. And we're constantly dealing with the potential of various negative impacts onto this tower. And more recently, with the industrial development that we have going on and switching over to residential development, there have been threats to the tower which would affect its view deck, which would affect its possibility to continue um, as a historic entity. Uh, so uh, the Friends of Tower Hill Park uh, were put together to be able to represent the interests of the park and the tower in dealing with issues that could have that negative effect. And we wanted to try and develop uh, its future use uh, by the neighborhood and by the city and by the state to avail themselves of this tremendous historic asset. Now, 
A number of years ago, we had the tower put on the National Register of Historic Places. It took a long time. And uh, that is a very, very involved uh, legal process. When it was actually listed by the Department of Interior, the Secretary of Interior designated this a historic asset for the residents of this country. So that is how our Department of Interior sees it. That is how the residents in Prospect Park see it. And we would like the rest of the Minneapolis, the state community to be able to see it. It's a big job and we have a lot of work to do. And to be able to help us assure that this will be here forever or as long as possible, we need help. We, the Friends of Tower Hill Park need people who are interested in preserving this to participate with us, to help us. Uh, so if you have any interest in joining the Friends and joining our efforts, we would greatly appreciate you coming forward.